Please be seated. The scripture reading this morning is from Acts 9, verses 26 through 28. Acts 9, 26 through 28. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. And they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and de declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly, boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. May God bless the reading of his word. Good morning. It is a blessing to be together today with those of a like precious faith to worship our common Savior. As Gary mentioned, today is Rake Day. And then we also have the worship service at Springvale Assisted Living. If you'd like to join us for that worship service, they do not require us to wear masks anymore. So we'd be glad to have you join us to encourage the residents of the nursing home there. Lad's Day will be next Sunday. This past Friday was Veterans Day. And as I do each year at this time, I would like to offer a special prayer on behalf of our veterans. Would you bow with me as we pray? Our God and Father in heaven, Above all, we are thankful that we have the opportunity to come into your presence this morning to worship you through your Son. We're thankful that we can join our hearts together in singing and praying and giving and reflecting on the sacrifice of your Son for our sins and to focus our minds on your Word. But we offer a special prayer at this time, Father, for our country we're thankful for the freedoms that we enjoy. We're especially thankful, Father, that we can worship you as our conscience guides us in accordance with your word. We're thankful, Father, for those men and women who have fought for our freedom. We ask your blessings, Father, on them this morning. There are many who come home who have wounds, physical wounds, and wounds that are not visible. We pray that you will bless them. We pray that you will guide them to find peace of mind. We pray that they will have their needs provided. We pray that they will find comfort and encouragement and support from family and from friends. And from a grateful nation. We pray your blessings on our nation. On our commander in chief. We pray that our country will honor you. By honoring your word. We pray that you will bless us as citizens both of your kingdom and members of this country. To be a, a light of an example. To guide others to Christ knowing that he has won the final battle, the battle over Satan and his efforts to deceive us and to lead us into sin. And we pray that you will bless us, Father, through the rest of this period of worship as we now focus our hearts and our minds on you and your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Last Sunday night, Sister Irene Henry met with the elders of the church here and expressed her desire to place membership with the Swartz Creek Church of Christ. Irene is sitting back there behind Merle Gentry, beside Ann. So if you don't know Irene, get to know her. If you already knew her before, welcome her back home. She was here for a few years when Rachel and I first moved here and then she 
she got crazy and moved to North Carolina. And then she regained her mind and she moved back. So we're thankful to have Irene back as a part of this congregation. And her decision is a perfect introduction to our discussion that we're going to have this morning. Do you have your copy of God's Word open to Acts chapter 9? In Acts chapter 9, this man by the name of Saul of Tarsus has become a Christian. He was baptized into Christ in the city of Damascus. But then he decides to come down to the city of Jerusalem and the text says that he wants to associate with the disciples there. The phrase we tend to use today is place membership. He wanted to place membership with the church of Christ in Jerusalem, having been baptized in a different location. But if you have the text open there in front of you, you'll see where the Christians there, the leaders of the church there, were not too thrilled with the idea of Saul of Tarsus being a member of their congregation. Do you remember why? Well, it had something to do maybe with Saul killing Christians. But now he's become a Christian now. And he's left that life behind him. But yet the Christians are still fearful of Saul. They're still apprehensive of allowing Saul to be a member of their congregation. Until Barnabas comes along. Barnabas is the one known for his encouragement. And so he believes Saul's story. That he saw Jesus. He was baptized into Christ. Had his sins forgiven. He's now a Christian and a preacher in fact. And so then the church believes Barnabas. Believes Saul's story. And they accept him as a member of their body. The elders of the Swartz Creek congregation now has asked me to, to deliver a lesson, a study on the topic of placing membership. And so if you're not a member of the Swartz Creek Church of Christ, now this lesson is kind of directed towards you. And so we want you to know that here is how the scriptures present this concept of being associated with a local body of people. Let's talk about members of the church in general for just a moment. You see, when somebody studies the Word of God and the Spirit through His Word guides them to conviction in Jesus Christ and His nature and the fact that He's the Savior, and it leads them to obey the gospel of Christ then they are baptized in the Christ and the Holy Spirit Himself makes them a part of Christ's church. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. I appreciate what Curtis had to say and he read from Acts chapter 2 at the Lord's table. If you read on down in Acts chapter 2 in verse 47, Luke writes that the God of heaven was adding people to his church, those who were being saved. And so man is not the one who adds somebody to the church of Christ. It's God himself, wherever that person happens to be, once they obey Jesus Christ, God is the one that adds them to his church. But now the church universal, and that's what we're talking about right now, the church universal does not have any organization. The church universal in a universal sense does not meet anywhere. It does not worship together anywhere. It does not assemble together anywhere. But rather God has created his church in such a way that it assembles together in local congregations of God's people. And so it is the local groups of Christians in each area that meet together, worship together, serve Christ together. And that's what we're talking about this morning. You see, God's Word does not know of what we might call Christians at large. Some Christian that is just kind of floating out there somewhere and worshiping God, maybe on their own or whatever, but are not associated with a local group of Christians. You see, the New Testament doesn't know anything about that. 
The way the New Testament presents Christianity is that Christians are supposed to be connected to a local body of people. The word church is used 114 times, the Greek word church is used 114 times in the New Testament. And the vast majority of those uses refer to the local group of Christians. Worshiping together, serving together, encouraging one another. You see, there are things that God expects Christians to do that requires us to be together in a local congregation of Christians. Here are just some of the things, and I'm going to eventually get to Ephesians chapter 4. So if you would turn to Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to begin reading at verse 9 in just a moment. But if you're taking notes, write these verses down and study them on your own time. But here are just some of the things that God expects Christians to do that we need to be together in order to do them. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. The Hebrew writer says that in the light of the temptation to leave Jesus Christ, the Hebrew writer says that we need to encourage one another as we assemble together. To stimulate each other to love and the good works in our assemblies. We also find that on the first day of every week, God's people assemble together around the Lord's table and we take the Lord's Supper. And we are encouraging each other when we do that. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 16 and 17 says that we have communion with one another when we take the Lord's Supper. You have your Bibles open there to Ephesians chapter 4. Beginning in verse 9. After quoting Psalm 68, the Apostle Paul says, Now, as to this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also first descended into the lowest parts of the earth? Now, he who descended is also he himself who ascended far above the heavens so that he might fill all things. Notice in verse 11, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers, notice verse 12, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature that belongs to Jesus Christ. As a result, as a result of the fact that we now attain to the unity of the faith, Paul writes, we're no longer to be children, tossed here and there, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by the craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love. Let us grow up into Him, unto the head who is Christ, from whom the whole body is fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies, according to the proper work of each individual part. It causes the growth of the body. For the building up of each other in love. Do you see there in the Apostle Paul's words how every Christian serves a special role in the body of Christ? This body is fitted and held together. Again, verse 16. Is fitted and held together by what every joint supplies. According to the proper working of every individual part. So the Swartz Creek Church of Christ will work together when every member is performing their own unique service that God has given to each one of us. Let's take a look at some other thoughts. Again, we're not going to look at all of these verses. I encourage you to write them down. Jesus wants us to teach and to encourage each other in the songs that we sing. 
We've got to be together in order to do that. Those who are watching our worship services on live stream, they can be encouraged by listening to the singing that we give, but they're not encouraging us because we can't hear them sing. We've got to be together in order to accomplish some of these things. We've got to be involved. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 3, the Apostle Paul commends the church in Thessalonica because of their work of faith and their labor of love and their steadfastness of hope. In Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 13, the Hebrew writer commends Christians. He says, because you are serving Jesus Christ by ministering to the saints. You see, we've got to be together in order to do that. We are to share the gospel of Christ with others. And a lot of times we do that together. Learning more about the gospel so that we can share more about the gospel. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. We are to teach the next generation of Christians. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. And we are also supposed to care for those who are often ignored in our society. Specifically, widows and orphans. James 1, 26 and 27. You see, so God's desire is for Christians in a local area to worship together and to work together. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 1. The Apostle Paul refers to letters of recommendation. That's basically what we're talking about in placing membership. These letters of recommendation in the first century were apparently letters that were sent from one congregation to another congregation of Christians in order to encourage them to have fellowship with certain Christians. So that's a, a bird's eye view of what the New Testament teaches about the work of individual members of the church of Christ. But let's take a look now at the leadership of the church and the responsibilities that elders have over the church. Take a look. Open your copy of God's Word to Acts chapter 14 and verse 23. Acts 14 and verse 23 is referring to the first mission trip that the first Christian missionaries had taken once the church was established and once Christians realized that God's gospel was open to everybody, not just the Jews, they said, hey, we need to send this message out at the hands of missionaries. And so Paul and Barnabas went on what's referred to as the first mission trip. And chapter 14 and verse 23, they're actually headed back home to give a report to the church that sent them out, the church of Christ in Antioch of Syria. But Acts chapter 14 and verse 23, Luke writes, When they have appointed elders in every church for them, after praying and fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So you see, God's pattern is for every church to have its own elders. The Greek word for elder is presbyteros, from which the denomination Presbyterian Church gets its name. Because at least originally they were governed by a group of elders. The word simply means an older person, as you might guess from the English word. Turn over to chapter 20 of Acts. And notice that the Apostle Paul gives a sermon, a speech, to elders of the church from Ephesus. That's verse 17. But I want you to pay attention to what Paul says about the work of the elders in verses 28 through 30. Do you have your Bibles open? Acts chapter 20. Beginning in verse 28, Paul is talking to elders. And he tells them, he says, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Let me stop right here for just a moment. That word overseer in the Greek language is episkopos, from which we get the English word bishop. The Episcopalian church gets its name from this word because they are overseen by a single man referred to as the bishop. Well, that's not God's pattern. But look there in Acts 20 and verse 28. The Holy Spirit has made you overseers or bishops over the flock over which the, the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Notice he says to feed the church of God or to shepherd the church of God. That's the verb associated with the word shepherd. 
to shepherd the flock of God which he purchased with his own blood. I'm going to get off this topic for just a quick second. I want you to notice there in verse 28 that the Apostle Paul says God shed his blood for the church. Do you catch that? God shed his blood for the church. New Testament theology teaches very clearly that Jesus Christ is God. He is God in the flesh. He is the Jehovah God of the Old Testament. Different persons, same nature. God shed his blood for the church. Back to verse 29 now. The Apostle Paul says, When I leave after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things in order to draw disciples after themselves. So we take a look at those three verses and we understand that elders are also referred to as bishops, that is overseers. An English translation of that could be superintendent. Somebody who looks out over the school system, they're the superintendent. Well, that's the same idea here. The, the elders look out over the church. But then elders are also called pastors. You see that? It's the elders who are to shepherd the flock of God. The word pastor is only used one time in modern translations, and that's in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. In Ephesians 4 and verse 11 that we've already looked at, Paul distinguishes an evangelist from a pastor. You see, evangelist and elders are two different positions, responsibilities in the church of Christ. So there in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, Paul says elders have to be careful for themselves and they have to be careful about the flock because the Holy Spirit has made them overseers of the flock. And in that context, Paul warns these elders there are going to be false teachers that come along and you have to be careful about them. So the verses are on the screen that uses this word overseer. The word for bishop. That is the word that carries the idea that elders are responsible. Elders are responsible for what goes on in the church. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 25. The apostle Peter tells his Christian audience, he says, you were straying away like sheep without a shepherd, but now you have returned to the, notice his words, the shepherd and the guardian of of your souls. So the Apostle Peter says that Jesus is the shepherd. We're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 4 in just a moment. But Peter there says that Jesus is the chief shepherd. But if you there, look there at 1 Peter 2 and verse 25, you'll notice that Peter also refers to Jesus as the guardian. We might say the chief bishop of your souls. So what that means is... The elders of the Swartz Creek Church of Christ answer to Jesus Christ. On the day of judgment, the elders of the Swartz Creek Church of Christ are going to have to stand before God and they're going to have to explain to God the reasons why they made the decision that they made. Elders are going to give an account for their work before God. And that makes that responsibility extremely important and extremely serious. Now, if elders are given the responsibility to oversee the flock, the implication is the church has a responsibility to be overseen. To be willing to submit to the guidance and the leadership of the shepherds that the Holy Spirit has put in charge over the church. I want you to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 and 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 and 13. This congregation of Christ's people apparently had not yet matured to the point where they could have elders over them. But they did have men who were leading the congregation of people. And I want you to listen closely to what Paul has to say to the church about their leaders. Do you have God's word open in front of you? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 beginning in verse 12. Paul says, but we request of you brethren... 
that you appreciate those who labor among you, who have charge over you in the Lord, and give you instruction that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. And he follows that with this admonition. Live at peace with one another. Do you notice Paul says that these men have charge over you in the Lord. They give you instruction. And he says you appreciate them and you esteem them. What does that mean? That means you've got to know one another. You've got to know one another. And so when the elders want to sit down to talk to you about being a member of the Swartz Creek Church of Christ, that is to fulfill this responsibility the elders have to know one another. What are your skills? What are your abilities? What are you interested in? What can you do for the Lord as a member of the Swartz Creek Church of Christ? The elders want to get together and talk to you about that. Turn over to Hebrews 13 and verse 17. Hebrews 13 and verse 17. The Christians the Hebrew writer is writing to, a lot of them apparently are members of bodies of Christ that do not yet have elders over them. But notice what the Hebrew writer says. Chapter 13 and verse 17. I love to hear those pages turning. I don't want you to take my word for it. I want you to listen to the Holy Spirit talk. Hebrews 13 and verse 17. Obey them, the leaders over the congregation, and submit to them because they keep watch over your souls. Notice what he says, as those who will give an account. And let them do this with joy and not with grief. For that would be unprofitable for you. So notice the Hebrew writer says that Christians need to Obey, they need to submit because the leadership of the church is going to give an account. Where there is stewardship, there is responsibility. And where there is responsibility, there is accountability. So God is going to hold elders accountable for the flock over which they serve. One more text that I want us to look at. Turn over to 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. The last text I want us to look at together as a church. 1 Peter 5, verses 1 through 4. Therefore I exhort you elders, as a fellow elder, Paul write, Peter writes, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and a partaker of the glory that is to be revealed. Notice what he says in verse 2. Shepherd the flock of God. Elders pastor the flock of God. Exercising oversight. Not under compulsion, but voluntarily. Not for sordid gain, but with eagerness. Not... Lording it over those who are given into your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. Notice verse 4. And when the chief shepherd, the chief bishop appears, you will receive an unfading crown of glory. So the apostle Peter was in fact an elder of the congregation where he worshipped. And he's encouraging other elders... He is saying now, be a shepherd to the flock. So the word bishop suggests the idea of authority. The idea that, that, that elders are looking out over the local congregation. But the word shepherd specifically refers to what elders are doing. They're shepherds. They're providing for the spiritual strength and development and nurture of Christians under their charge. And so Peter says, do that. Not reluctantly, not under compulsion, but do it voluntarily. Do it with eagerness. And be examples to the flock. And so we've looked at the responsibility that individual Christians have. And we've looked at responsibilities that elders of the church have. 
But I want us to also take a look at this idea of placing membership. The idea of placing membership. So that Christians know each other. We know each other. We know the strengths that each other has. And, and, and we meet with the elders so the elders can know who we are. And we can know who the elders are. And the elders can put us in the church where our skills are best used. How is it? Remember, elders answer to Jesus Christ. How is it that elders can extend, in the words of the Apostle Paul, the right hand of fellowship to somebody who, in fact, is not in fellowship with Jesus Christ? How can the elders put somebody out there in the service of the church here whose lives, in fact, are not reflecting the teachings of Jesus Christ? How can elders ask a man to serve in worship of the church when that man may, in fact, not be in a relationship with Jesus Christ? In fact, they cannot. And so that's the reason, part of the reason, why elders want to meet with those to be members here so that the elders can know where you are. What's your background? How did you get to where you are right now? So there are some questions that the elders might want to ask. Why do the elders want to ask questions? Well, because Jesus himself says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 11 that the church is not supposed to have fellowship with those who are sexually immoral and drunkards and covetous and, and swindlers and revilers and people who live like the world. So the elders and, and have to be careful about the negative influences that are in the congregation in order to protect the flock. Well, how can they take care of the flock like that? By meeting with people who want to be members of the Swartz Creek Church of Christ. Doesn't that make sense? Isn't that respectful to, to the elders and their responsibility? Now, if somebody is, is baptized here at Swartz Creek, the, the assumption is that you, you want to be a member of the Swartz Creek Church of Christ. That, that's, the, that's the assumption. Unless you're from somewhere else and you happen to be baptized here and you're going somewhere else to be a member somewhere else. Otherwise, we just assume that you're going to be under the, the supervision of the elders here. And so, if you want to be associated with the Swartz Creek Church of Christ, if you want, if you want to, to serve the Savior as a part of the Swartz Creek Church of Christ, meet with the elders and say, I want to be associated with this group of Christians. Let's talk about what I can do and how I can be used. Now, if one of the elders approaches you and says, let's meet with you. The elders want to meet with you. Don't be intimidated. Don't be fearful. Do I look like I'm intimidating? If the elders meet with you, you should consider it an honor. You consider it an honor that the elders see something in you that says they want me to be a part of this congregation and meet with them and talk to them so that we can serve our Savior together. So this phrase, placing membership, no, it's not found in the Scriptures in those words. But that's exactly what Saul of Tarsus was trying to do in Acts chapter, Acts chapter 9. And we see from this series of studies that it is very much a biblical idea. God wants us, Jesus wants us to be a part of a local body of Christians. So we can know each other. So we can encourage each other. So we can pray for each other. We got a phone call yesterday from a member of this congregation saying, I need prayers. That's what the local body of Christians is for. And so again, if you're not, a, if you're not haven't met with the elders yet and you want to be a part of this congregation, let the elders know. Sit down and talk to them. And again, if the elders, one of the elders approaches you and says, we, let's, let's meet with the elders, don't be fearful. Be thankful. Be honored that the elders want to meet with you and talk about being a member of the Swartz Creek Church of Christ. If we were to go through and study the letter of Ephesians, and Jared is really preaching through Ephesians, and he's preaching tonight from chapter 2. But if we study on through Ephesians, 
we see where the Apostle Paul says that the church was in the eternal plans of God. The eternal plans of God. Which means that before God even said, let there be light, God said, let there be the church. And as we saw there from Acts 20 and verse 28, it's the church that is the recipient of the blood of Jesus Christ. That's how wonderful it is to be a member of the church of Christ. If you are not yet a member of the church of Christ. Curtis read this morning as we were talk, uh, getting ready to take the Lord's Supper. He read from Acts chapter 2, specifically verse 38. Where the Apostle Peter says to the Jews, Let every one of you repent of your sins and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's what we have to do in order to become a member of the church of Christ. If we can help you be forgiven of your sins through the blood of Christ, let us know. We'll sit down and study with you. I'll skip lunch if I have to to study with you. Well, I'll, we'll have lunch provided. Whatever we can do to help you be right with Jesus Christ, let us know. Let's stand and sing together. Oh, to Jesus I surrender all to Him. Oh.